So here is one ideology uh, declaring itself uh, a primacy in the way that fundamentalisms do. My religion is uh, fundamental and right, and no others can be accepted, and it cannot change. So, uh, so who rules? Uh, I, you can see this now as the great Hindu drama, science versus capitalism, the counterforce versus the dominant, versus the hegemonic force that we live in. And I, unless we see it in those terms, we don't know how to back the winning side. So I am saying that the humanities and the arts need to become gigantic supporters of science, need to become scientific li scientifically literate, which does not require becoming um, uh, hugely mathematical. Um, although that language of adherences is difficult, subtle, and uh, a lifetime study to get even a portion of it, the basic um, uh, fundamentals of it are as easy as addition and multiplication and need to be internalized. But in any case, even if you're an English major like me and that whole thing is just like, I don't want to think about mathematics, I'm not good at any foreign languages, but particularly not one that is sort of alien to human consciousness. <laughs> um, the humanities can theorize science because science doesn't want to do it themselves. Here, my metaphor would simply be Frankenstein's monster. And the, the, the capitalism's gun to the head of science is actually the he, to the head of a headless beast. The science does not want to theorize itself, and it's precisely what philosophy, the humanities, is there to do for them in a conciliant project of uh, uh, an overarching humanitarian project. It's, if we've got Frankenstein's monster, enormously powerful, willing to be, go in the right direction if they can be told what it is, then, then we are, in, a, in effect, uh, science's <coughs> brain, or value system, you might say, or the sense of direction for it. So you do get science studies. I mean, it's very important to read Thomas Kuhn, very important to read Bruno Latour. Um, it, it, once you've read, and, and even scientists can agree that science in action, where Latour, acting as an anthropologist, acting as if he were Levi Strauss coming into a strange tribe with strange practices, studied scientists in action. And that book, I mean, people talk about, uh, you know how you pasteurize milk. Well, people talk about the Latourization, uh, uh, pasteurization of milk, Latourization of science studies. Ever since Science in Action, science studies has been a sophisticated theoretical tool for historicizing the sciences. And when you historicize, you keep on getting back to, uh, you go, keep going back, you keep going back, you keep going back, you're at the Paleolithic. You're at our beginnings as creatures. Why are we the creatures that we are? And this is a historical question. It's also a scientific question that has better answers than ever before. Um, and and these, these questions can be pursued and, and need to be pursued in order to uh, essentially bulk up the work of the big battle that we are in in our time to try to seize control of history and push it in the right direction given the emergency of climate change. So I'm saying uh, that there is a, a, an effort that science might be the lead uh, investigator, the, the PI, the principal investigator, but that government, as being the people's company, the, the, the collective, the already existing leftism, government itself, uh, democratic government, uh, environmentalism, uh, all of the, a kind of left popular front that needs to band together as one conciliant force and not be misunderstanding and, and calling the, the power with the gun to its head a mere collaborator when really it's been a counterforce all along. And at that point you can begin to talk about justice as a survival technology. I mean it turns out that without social justice we are in a terrible situation in the biosphere because of population growth. It's social justice that brings population levels down to a manageable level. That the, it's the richest and the poorest people on this planet that have by far the, the, the most terrific environmental bad impact. The poor because of this topsoil loss and deforestation. The rich because of hyperconsumption. So that um, it used to be that social justice was a, a moral idea, an, an ethical idea. Well, what's that? But now it's simply a survival mechanism, and can, it can, you can add the force of emergency survival to the notion of a moral good. 
Um, and so there becomes a, 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 you need to be a good parasite to your host. And sometimes we say you need to be a good shepherd to your flock because we want to think that we're in control, but we are not. So no matter what image you use of our relationship to the natural world, parasite, steward, um, shepherd, you nevertheless have a project involved, which is to get food, water, shelter, clothing, health care, education, and peace to everybody on the planet equally in a sufficiency so that everybody has what is just right. Everybody has enough, but not too much. And so there, to end, and this is the only time I'll mention it, you get science as a religion. It's a religion in the sense of religio. It's what binds us together. It is a form of devotion. Um, the scientific study of the world is simply a kind of worship of it. A very detailed, painstaking, and often tedious daily worship like Zen. So you can think of science as a religion and a, a, a devotion to something that you can easily regard as miraculous. I mean, the Big Bang, out of a singularity of, of a, a point, geometrical point of infinite uh, mass, um, in the, has an inflationary period where at 10 to the minus 33 seconds after the beginning of everything, uh, suddenly there was an expansion of 10 to the 30 time. This is our current uh, explanation of our universe, if that's not sounding miraculous to you. I don't know what would sound miraculous. So we have all of the components of religion there in the, the science of religion. And so this has been my uh, science fiction for the day. <laughs> Thank you. Shall we? Uh, there's time for questions. Yeah. Time for questions. Absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, if I could start. Yeah. Uh, my question is about uh, is about the atom bomb, and, and I mean maybe you can you can play mind reader or, or write a novel about this someday. But but why they made it and why they made it in the way they made it. Um, people sometimes fantasize that Heisenberg in Germany sabotaged the German bomb project by essentially lying to the German government about its possibility. Can you be loud? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, why, did, why did we make the bomb? Um, people sometimes say that Heisenberg uh, sabotaged the German pro bomb project by lying to them about its possibility and claiming that it was not possible. Um, and if you watch some of the documentaries about uh, the Manhattan Project, you see that there was, a, there was a kind of concern among the scientists about what they were doing. There's a famous memo about whether or not it would set the earth on fire right. um, and things like this, but that, that was kind of disconnected in some way um, from Oppenheimer, who, thinking uh, in another direction of your talk, was eventually ostracized and destroyed by the government, right, again, for being dangerous. Um, and so just thinking, you know, I really like the talk and I love the idea of science as this kind of utopian project, but then I always return with my obsessive paranoia of it to the nuclear bomb and, and what it's doing there? Well, the, uh, uh, Richard Rhodes, The Making of the Atom Bomb, and, and then also the, the, the um, memoirs of the participants are definitely worth reading because they knew what they were up to and it was a scary thing. There was this memo, might we ignite the entire atmosphere of the Earth? Oh, I, let's try it and see. <laughs> <laughs> this is scary. Uh, but, and I think that it, I'm, it, I spoke to this moment of hubris, the euphoria of power. When we finally got uh, traction and suddenly we're changing the world so rapidly, there was a euphoria that we had everything in hand. And it took the reversals of the atom bomb and the, the environmental catastrophe of DDT, etc., cetera, um, to uh, put a, a, a reality check on the sciences and cause them to re-examine what they were doing. At that moment, there were individuals, and, and the one I would point to is Leo Zillard. Mm -hmm. um, he was the one that said, look, we, uh, making this bomb is probably a mistake, but since we've made it, it makes a perfect war ender as a demonstration only because it's just too dangerous even to use. And his effort uh, did not manage to make it through to Truman, or if it did, Truman decided against it. So uh, I, 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 this is a complicated story, but I... I Say you have science as a utopian force, it can still be suborned. It's still just a collective, and the individuals in it can go power mad. They can say, oh, well, I'd rather get rich. Uh, I have given a somewhat of a uh, uh, positive account of 